Well, praise God. I hope you're ready to get started in the, in the work tonight. And uh, if any of you are wondering what my hobby is and what our vacation time is spent on, I think we have a couple of slides for you. Are they, are they up? It's, a, it's where we spend our vacations and our honeymoon and all that good stuff. And those are called piers. And uh, is, I think we got some more, don't we? Oh, I have that. Will it click? There you go. Praise God. You know, I, I look at these things. They're they're peers, and we are. If you were standing out in my driveway, the bottom of this tunnel below the footing is ten feet below the driveway, maybe eleven in some areas. And we had to undermine that to get directly under the footing so that we can get the footing to the place it's supposed to be. Each one of these uh, piers, you can see there's a steel I-beam with some gussets welded on it, and then there's a crown on top of that, and those bolts are run up, or the nuts are on the bolts after you jack it into place, and then the jacks are pulled out. Also to hold up areas that are insecure. You gotta have bedrock in your life and it creates problems because everything moves in the surface in your life if you don't have bedrock. You gotta find that. Each one of these piers were punched down with uh, 60,000 pounds of pressure into the ground until it lifted, each pier lifted the house, lifted it several times, trying to punch it down further, so that the weight was shifted from the ground that's not solid down to bedrock that is solid. Now, when I look at things like this, I'm astounded that uh, there's many principles in our life that are weak, and if those principles in our life are weak, whatever particular point it is, then we need to shore that up. But it takes a lot of digging. The day before yesterday, I worked with two other guys and closed down the hole for a while digging, and we got all the dirt loose, and then finally started hucking it out. And so one guy's with a shovel hucking it into buckets. I was on a little bridge that is right next to the window that goes outside up to the driveway, and he would hand up about five or eight buckets, and then I would take those and lift those up and step off on another step and get it up to my shoulders and then hack it out the window. They're about 120 pounds a bucket. Is there better? I'm at 1.5 cubic feet in each bucket. That was not full. And I looked up on the internet to see, okay, how much is a cubic foot, and how much does that weigh, and of what material, and, and uh, you know, we moved 9,800 pounds out, out that window. And so my bones are saying, hey, you up there, fool, <laughs> I'm going to get even with you, I'm going to get even with you. Now, the body may be screaming at the top of its lungs, but it's necessary that it does so to get these piers in the ground. So point by point, theologically, there are things in us that are unstable. And if it's just a single point, it can still cause a fracture or still get things out of alignment in the upper regions of our house. And you realize we're supposed to be going from one glory to the next glory to the next glory, is what the scripture says. That's going from the first story to the second story to the third story to the fourth story to the fifth story. The higher you build, the more weight there is on the, founding, on the footings. One of the problems with this house was that it had cedar shingles on it, which it didn't weigh very much, but it also had plaster and two inches of plaster on the walls because that's where its thermal grid is at, is inside that plaster to heat the house. When they changed out and put asphalt shingles on it, now they added a semi-load, probably 80,000 pounds of weight to the roof. And then when we got 200,000 pounds of snow on top of the roof, then it was more than a one-foot footing could hold. Which brings me down to our belief system. If your faith is only that wide, it's going to take 2,000 pounds per square, square inch to hold it up. 
But if you get 80,000 pounds on it, that means it's not going to... We need something wider. Our faith needs to be wider. So it was necessary to do all this undermining so that a wider foot can be put into place. And I reckon that, like our faith, it's taken me a long time to make all these steel piers. I've got a whole bunch of them still outside. Make all the crowns and all the caps and all that stuff. And I talked to a peer company, and if we did the demolition for the number of piers that I put in, they wanted like two ten to two hundred and thirty thousand dollars just to set the piers. If I did the excavation and got all the stuff out of the way for them, and then I did the repairs, that's not them doing any repairs. That's just them setting the piers, and it was not them backfilling with cement. The point is, if you want somebody else to do the work for you in your spiritual life, the cost is too great. And I don't think there's anybody that could tackle what's on the depths of the inside of us that's out of kelter with God. Because we know the weak spots. We know where the cracks are. And we keep those covered up so well. But if you're willing to work with God, He's willing to work with you. And He's willing to help you undermine to get down to the real truth of the false things that we call truth and the real truth of the inaccuracies that are in the depths of our soul. He's willing to work with us to get to that so that he can help us put down something solid enough that it can get down to bedrock. Where these piers right here, each one of these piers would hold around 230,000 pounds and load because of the steel that I used in them. Each pier, each pier. And I can tell you God's peers that he can take to bedrock to help stabilize your life, all of his truths, are much stronger than these, much better equipped to help us so that our life becomes stable so that we can go from one glory to the next glory to the next glory to the next glory. Some people I meet and say, man, I wish I had experiences with God. Well, those happen in the top floor. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're dying in a hole somewhere and the Lord comes along to help drag you out. And he don't want us to live in a hole. He wants us to live with him up on the top floor. Build your life carefully. Build it with purpose and intent. Build it with him. Get down to the things that cause you to be unstable in your relationships with each other and your functionality with him. Or how about even in regular life living? How about your business deals? How about your, you have a weak area and a soft spot towards your own recreation, towards your own loves and pleasures so that God is somehow neglected in that? Then he can help you straighten that out. He can help you. Build what is necessary so that that area becomes shored up. This is a very special day. I don't know if you know this or not, but since evening, as of yesterday, Yom Kippur occurred. It's not quite over with because I see a little bit of daylight left outside. And what Yom Kippur is, every trumpet in heaven has been blowing now for nearly 24 hours making the proclamations of God's great blessings, a proclamation of his great judgments for him to govern this next year in our lives. And he gave us 10 days in which we've talked about that to get our name out of the book of the wicked things that we did so that we're not in the book of the in-between so we can get in the book of the good. So if your name's in the book of the good on everything, then the high priest would come out and pronounce blessings over you for the upcoming year. Everything goes in times and seasons according to scripture. Now some people say, oh man, the book of the evil. Yeah, if we've done evil, our name goes in there for that thing. But now, however, if we've done good, our name goes in that book. So God's got this problem of wanting to be just and he's saying, okay, you spend about 70% of your time for yourself 30% of the time, somewhere in between, and maybe 5% of your time doing actual things in my kingdom for me. I don't know if you've kept a record in a logbook, but there's a time clock that every 
even idle word that we speak is going to be registered on that time clock. I think it's so gracious of the Lord. The angels think it's gracious of the Lord for him to say, when the new year hits, I'm not going to pass judgment. I'm going to give you 10 days to see if you can square things with me because I want you to receive the blessings that are coming up this next year. Somebody said, well, what's the book of the in-between for? Jesus is so kind and so merciful. So kind and so merciful. That if I have done some 5% good, and the rest of it is about self over here, you realize self is evil, right? Selfishness. Godlessness. Godlessness is evil too. You know what God less? It's something that you do that's less God. He is so gracious that if we have done anything in this book over here, he would at least write our name in the middle book of those in between. So harsh judgment will not be put upon us for the following year. I don't know of any greater grace than you can do than that. Now, I know some people get upset. Well, what do you mean the books? Well, look in Revelation. It's in there. They open the books. Then they open the book of the Lamb. So God gives us a whole 10 days to help for us to pray and examine ourselves and look. Is there, is there anything you want to make right with me? Do you, do you want to change the fact that you serve yourself in this area? And you know what that area is. Every time he mentions that area, you duck your head because you don't even want to talk about it. You don't want to listen about it because you're going to have to give up something. Well, Jesus gave up his life. And he's wanting to give us life, not take something from us. He doesn't need your life. You need his life. That's why you'll be in constant conflict and constant problems. And the enemy will have a right to touch everything that we happen to have possession of. It's important to think about the things that are self-centered, self-purposed self-thoughts because what it means is our house is built on sand and it means that a storm is going to come and a flood is going to come and if you're foolish enough to think that it's not going to come you're foolish enough that you're going to watch your house collapse and not have anything maybe even have to live under a bridge if it'll help you in your relationship with God that might be a good thing because if God can get your soul saved enough that you begin to walk with him and listen to him, he's interested in your long-term relationship. He's interested in making sure that you're safe. He's interested in you knowing him. If the things you have in your hand are God-less, then they prevent you from doing that. So he gave us those 10 days, and, and I hope that you've taken that serious. I, I really do. If you didn't, and you have a little bit for you over here, now you're in the book of the in-between, which that's good. It means you don't get any cursed judgments. But if you're in the book of the in-between, a high priest was to come out on this day. The trumpets blowed all day long. And the high priest behind the curtain, listening to God's voice, for hours on end, and was to come out and give specific blessings to the nation and even individual blessings to the people. I hope and pray that you've been serious about, enough about this because there will be some blessings that will be passed out. I'm hoping that you understand that everything's been stored up for you in heaven so that even if you didn't do things right and you, your proposition was, well, I'm not ready to give that up. I like it. And you're going to have to come and bless it. And he said, I'm not coming and blessing it. Not only that... I can't bless your year that you have coming up. You realize how much God wants to bless us. But we would rather take our cookie, our stingy cookie, me, myself, and I, then we would rather have that when we would his blessing. So there's this balance that constantly goes on, and Jesus is very good about making his judgments. In Acts 17.30, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge 
governed the world in righteousness by the man whom he ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, I know if you're good evangelical, all of a sudden they put in your head that, oh, well, this is the end of time. Well, I don't see that it says the end of time in there. It says that he's resurrected and he's alive. And the very word that's being used there is judge is a different meaning than we think instead of somebody just throwing the gobble down. Another passage of Scripture, Psalm 96, 13. He's coming. And he is coming to judge the earth. Again, it's not the second coming. This is before his first coming. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. What's he judging? The world. What's the second judgment? It's not about the world. The world has been done away with, and that's a great white throne of judgment for what you did do and didn't do that you should have done. But here, his first coming was about bringing government to the earth, God's government back to the earth. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble, and you surround me with songs of deliverance. I personally think that's what goes on. You realize, for 10 days, he's been interceding before the Father for us. For 10 days, he's been interceding and saying, give me something to intercede with. Will you change one thing in your thought process? Will you repent of the things that don't have me in them? And as we're doing that, he allows us to hide in him because he knows how hard it is for us to turn loose of our great grubby little baby fingers that has hold of our sucky thing that we want to, that makes me feel good about myself. He, he understands that. And even in that, when he comes forth and the books are closed, he understands. Well, you left a little trouble for yourself. Because there's some things you didn't want to change. But I'm going to surround you with songs. Songs of him sweeping through our soul. Trying to get us to come into agreement with him. And his deliverance that he has from us. From our little baby toys in our crib. His deliverance that he has, songs of deliverance he sings to us and said, come to me, my love, come to me, my bride, run to me. And then we can see some of the stature and some of the glory of our great God. Do you think any angel in heaven is interested in some of the silly things that we get stuck on that we have to have, me, myself, and I? You think there's one angel that wants the toys that you have? No. When we get there, we'll just drop them out of our hands and think, oh my goodness, I'm such a fool. I was willing to exchange your presence and your glory for what would satisfy me. But the truth is, it's never satisfied you. The truth is, it's your hiding place to hide from him. Because it satisfies you instead of him satisfying you. If you have something that satisfies you and gives you great exhilaration that's not him, you have a problem. But the Lord will surround you with songs of deliverance. And when he is our high priest for these last 10 days, hovering over us and saying, oh, come, my love, come and do it my way. With great songs, he's wanting us to be delivered Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. See, the Lord's trying to get us in the position of him being the perpetuation for everything that we've done. Now, I know if you're good evangelical, that's Psalms 105, by the way. If you're good evangelical, then you think, okay, well, the perpetuation was his blood that he poured out. Mm, granted, that plays a small part, but perpetuation has much, much more weightier meat to it than that. The passage of Scripture, before the Lord, he is coming to judge the earth. Again, that word there, judge, is sapat in Hebrew, 
And it doesn't mean just throw down the gavel. It's got a really deep meaning. It says he will judge the world. Again, the world's involved in that judgment. And with righteousness. We know when the world is melted away, when we stand before the great white throne, that he's not judging the earth. The earth has been melted. Instead, he's judging us again for what we did do and what we didn't do that we were supposed to do. And another reason that we know that he's judging is because he's judging the people with equity. Equity. See, he really has, uh, once he took control and was set on the throne, he was given dominion over earth. No man had dominion over earth since Adam. God gave that to man, and he didn't take it back from man, so the earth was just kind of a wild, woolly booger with a real ring-tailed Tudor red devil dragon in charge of it. Now Jesus coming, becoming a man, again to him was handed the throne of David, which again is here on this earth, not in the heavens. And he's judging. He's judging. Now, I know there's many people who say, well, he doesn't judge. Well, according to Scripture, he does. According to Scripture, that's what he ascended for. But we're not talking about the great white throne scene, nor the chair we watched a film on. The chair that he sits in and passes judgments on and hands out rewards. We watch that. Anybody remember the name of that? What was the name of that? The Bema Seat. That's exactly right. So the Bema Seat is coming, but that's not here on the earth. That's standing before him in his throne room after the great wedding supper. Let's go on here. It's a pot in Hebrew, a verb meaning to govern. Ah, This word... Though often translated a judge is more inclusive than modern concepts of judging and encompasses all the facets and functions of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judicial part. He assumed all those roles. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is so you can take serious about the days of awe and you can take serious that the trumpet started blowing last night and they have not started blowing until it's dark outside. And you know what the cheers are for? Do you know what the trumpets are for? Of the great proclamations of God, as soon as the trumpets stop, the blessings begin. The trumpets were the announcement and the predecessor of all the blessings that are supposed to be poured out this upcoming year on, on you, for you, about you, and in you, but all of those in him, about him, and for him. But we're going to have to separate ourselves from those things. And I love it that if there's something you decided to hang on to, it's too late to get the blessing for giving it up. But it's not too late to win his favor and his counsel of how to walk through it and get through it so you can give it up this next year. So you can give it up between now and then. And you'll have it resolved before you ever get there. Are you willing to do that? Because if you are, it's going to cost you something. If you want his functionality and his governing process to take place from the heavens where he can intervene in our lives, because most of us are, some are real savvy. Some are in the middle of savvy and some aren't too savvy. If you're real savvy, you've got some real problems. Why? Because you'll want control instead of God being in control. And if you're in control, again, if you own the house, who's responsible for the maintenance and upkeep and care of it? You are. You got to pay the bills, roof leaks, you got to fix it. Flood comes, washes the house away. God says, Well, sorry about your house. Should have got some flood insurance. Call my son, let him do it. The way he wants. You bought the wrong house, too. <laughs> Sorry about the house, but you chose it. I told you. I, would, I was talking to you, but you wouldn't listen. The scripture says that there's going to be a test, and if you built on the sand of me, myself, and I, I'm throwing that in there, 
then it will be washed away. But if you build on the rock, very uncomfortable building on the rock. It's what I'm trying to get my house down to is the rock. Somebody said, wow, it's going to be a fortress. Man, if an earthquake comes, you'll be ready. I said, yeah, the part I fixed will still be standing, but the other half will be gone. <laughs> you know? Jesus is the great ruler is where I'm trying to take us. The great king that passionately cares for us and the things that we have to go through. In Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever and holds the priesthood permanently, just got through talking about the Arianic priesthood versus Melchizedek. Anybody know who Melchizedek is? Man, this guy's a mystery guy. Somebody told me, well, he was just from Salem. No, he was a pagan. They worshipped other gods there. And besides that, in the New Testament, the Old it says that he didn't have any genealogy. He wasn't created. He was before the beginning of time. And he was priest standing in the presence of the living God. And I could go on and on. There's about 35 other passages of Scripture that has some spectacular things to say about him. Why? That was Jesus in service to his father. He took that position for a while. You know, if you had a big factory and you're running everything and you're going to become a human being, you're part of the Godhead, you'd say, hey, you know, I think it'd be a good idea if I worked in the mailroom a while. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be a good idea if I went down and visited Earth a little while. Why? If you're a son, you need to know everything that goes on, how it feels, what it looks like. How your employees, what they're having to go through. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God. Who's he able to save? Those who said, uh, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. Now come and bless my stuff. Is that what it says? Who's he able to save? I'm not hearing anyone. Anyway, turn these up. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? No way except through him. God will not accept any other door, any other way. And he even gives us a parable of somebody thinking they got in, dropped in, not clothed, not ready. And the father walks in and says, what are you doing here? Well, I'm here for the banquet. Well, you're not dressed. Who are you? Where's your invitation? Guards, guards. He's not even going to have a conversation. Bind him hand and foot. Cast him out into everlasting darkness. There is no other way into the Father's presence except through Jesus Christ. None. Zero. Blanco. Nothing. Not a Denise. Nothing. No other way but Jesus. Only door that there is. And the reason being is because... See, now we look at it that he gave his life for us. But do you realize he gave up his throne... To come down and squeeze into a body and be miserable for 33 years. He was the talk of the town, stood before the Father, angels adored him. And he gives up his crown and all of his power and all of his authority and squeezes himself in this little bitty baby that does things smelly in diapers. What a humiliation! I find that a far greater humiliation to go from the likeness of God into the form of a defective man far greater I think on the other side the father saw him do some things that were so far beyond anybody else you remember John's report in the book of Revelation that you know who's worthy to open the scrolls and no one was found everybody was bawling in heaven and John himself lost it. Oh, God. There's no... Do you realize without the scrolls opening up, time could not go on. Nothing could take place. Everything is stuck in heaven and on the earth because everything that's supposed to be taking place is written on the back of that scroll and on the interior of that scroll. Everything's frozen in time because no one was found worthy. Not amongst the angels. Not in the upper heavens. Not in the fourth heaven, not in the third heaven, not certainly down here on earth, not in the place of death. No one was worthy to open the scrolls until Jesus himself shows up on the throne as a lamb. Again, his entrance is one of a stinky sheep, smelling like a sheep, bloodied like a sheep, 
gutted like a sheep. And he appears before the angels that way. Back on his throne. And then is transformed into the king of kings and lord of lords. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wow. I see me being a good evangelical. Well, you know, hey, Jesus splattered his blood around. And it, it's okay. Everything was taken care of. Well, why is he having to intercede for me? Why is he having to continually intercede for me? And when am I going to start cooperating with him in his intercession for me? And what is he, what is he interceding for? Because there's still some defects in me and some things that I should be tossed into the fire over and cast away from his presence. There's things that go on inside me that he should never speak to me again, let alone show me anything in his heavens, let alone let me feel his presence, let alone... Be swept inside and cleansed inside from the cringing gremlin that's in there. He's making intercession knowing these things. There will be no end to the increase of his government. <laughs> I love that. because uh, what, is it, what does it say, no end to the increase? So his government's increasing. What is he waiting for, for his government to increase? See, he could da come down with his track shoes and put his foot in the back of my neck and send some alligators after me where I'd have to run towards him. But he's waiting for me to surrender the part of my world that only I own and he gave me dominion over. He's, he's waiting. Will you transfer that to me? Will you bring your world and your kingdom under my dominion? So that his government will increase in me, here on the earth. His government is supposed to increase, but his peace also will increase for us. Remember, peace is not a cessation of events. It's the great orchestra leader lifting his baton and now making all those things in your life that are out of whack, that are on fire, making them... See, our prayer is, Lord, make them do what I want so to benefit me. And God's saying, no, you play your part. And I'll make them play my part, not your part. The only way for those enemies to settle down is for them to have to do it God's way, not my way. So even when I stop praying, oh, God, I need you to do this, and start praying, Father, not my will, but your will. You know, there was somebody else that prayed that. Y'all realize that. <laughs> and and he, by the way, he was our example. The real thing that was sent as the sample, the end sample, the example, the one to model ourselves after. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice. Where's David's throne and David's kingdom at? It's here on earth. That's why Jesus is going to come back for the thousand years to rule on that throne of David because it's not the throne of David in the second... When, when, when God descends with that city and Jesus descends and he makes a new heaven and earth, the throne of David is not there. The throne of Jesus is. And God himself is the light in it. So when Jesus comes for the thousand year reign, as we found out in a study in the book of Revelation, we found out he comes to sit on the throne of David. And accomplish everything he gave David to accomplish. Which is the same thing he gave man to accomplish in the beginning. As to subdue the earth and bring it under the government of God. I, I love the, the new year of God. And the angels seem to love the new year of God. Now it took me a while to get used to that. And get used to, you mean you're tracking me? You got a surveillance camera on me? You're writing it down? You're taking video? <laughs> oh, God, if you just didn't have the video, I could kind of squirm out of it and just say nonchalantly, well, just forgive me. Not realizing the cost to him. Not realizing the intercession that he has to do because the enemy rushes in with an ownership paper and say, see, the guy is a devil. The lady is a devil. 
She does what she wants. She says what she wants. He does what he wants. He says what he wants. He's not saying what you do. He belongs to me. And he's got the proof. But Jesus steps right in between Father and Satan. You realize Satan still has access. You realize that? To bring accusation against us. Until the last day, and the only one, the only one that cares enough for us, the only one that's gone through the turmoil of resisting sin and didn't take it. He has such great mercy and compassion knowing, oh my goodness, devil, you're trying to hook them just like you did me out in the desert. But they don't have the strength. They don't know who they are in me. So he's interceding with great mercy and great passion for us. He looks for everything, and he's the trickiest lawyer, lawyer in heaven. <laughs> he's got some loopholes that Satan don't know about. To pull us into the book of the in-between while he's waiting to get us into the book of the good. Isn't that cool? I just, I just think that's absolutely mesmerizing. The zeal of the Lord of the host will accomplish this. I love that statement. What is he accomplishing? That he's going to bring justice and what else? Righteousness from then on. For, you, you realize while he's doing this justice, I need some righteousness. And where's the righteousness going to come from in the midst of that? From him. Out of his zeal. If I'm short on righteousness that day and my name's over here in this wrong book. He's not short on righteousness. If I belong to him, guess what? He's a double dealer. He'll throw some of his righteousness in there. I love that. I love that. He's fully in control. But what we don't understand, we're supposed to be in cooperation with him and realizing the undaunting task that takes place for him to stand there day after day, year after year, interceding for us and trying to get us involved in his government instead of us doing things our way. Romans 8, 34. Who is the one who condemns? See, if our book is in the book of the evil, we've got some things in the book of the good, somebody's going to be talking about this book over here, right? Who's the one that condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. He condemns. Did you realize that? But because he's got these three books, he's holding his condemnation, hoping to convince us to start doing things right before him. He's holding his condemnation. That will come at the end of time. And between now and then, it's conviction of the Spirit, and it's the books. And what we lose is the blessings we could have. And if you don't have those blessings, what's going to happen to the seeds you planted? It means you planted some lulus. How many of you got a Lulu garden coming this next year? How many of you went through a Lulu garden last year? Uh, a bunch of chickens won't raise your hand, huh? <laughs> One honest man in the crowd. <laughs> rest of you are all what? Let God be truth, and every man a liar. He is full of truth. He sits at the right hand. Of God and he he's, he's he's been interceding for ten days for us and now it's sun is down the books are closed the trumpets are stopped and the great blessings of God like peals lightning coming off the throne are being delivered here to this earth for every person God has good things planned for us not bad things. He's trying to intercede in the bad things that will happen to our selfishness and our self-will and our own control. He's trying, to, he's trying to intervene in that, to head those things up. He sees us, oh, you got a handful of wheat seeds, and man, those things are blackberry vines. And you were just throwing them out by the thousands. I've got to do something. He's, he, he's, he's in the business of wanting to help us, knowing, oh, you, you sold those. Oh, okay, I'm going to be behind you. I'm going to throw a little flame here and a little flame there. I've got to get you some little area cleared so maybe a little food can come up that you can survive this year. And I've met some people, so many things are going on in their life. Have you ever 
gone through a blackberry bramble and got hung in it. I got hung in one when I was a kid. <laughs> I used to live lived in Oregon one time, Eugene, down on the Willamette River, about six blocks from the river. And my brother would go down, and I'd go down every day. And we got to chasing pheasant through the blackberry brambles. We were little guys, you know. But we found out that there was these kind of like cave things, and we'd get down and just, and if you really run fast, and all of a sudden you hit something, that here and the other side goes in, and you spin around, and you just lay, and you're not even on the ground anymore. You hung in the air on blackberry bramble. I've been in many situations with you. Some of the things I've seen you, you in, bloodied, hurt, wounded, hung on something and not knowing what got you. But it's because of seeds that you planted in your life. And Jesus is so desperately trying to help us out of that situation so that we can stop planting those kind of seeds. And he's interceding for us. He cares for us. He really, really, really cares for us. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Holy Spirit. But we don't even know how to pray. How do you pray when you're hung in a bush and it's your thorns that you planted? We don't know how we should pray to get out of it. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Groanings. Again, that's connected so that Jesus can be interceding for us. Maybe even pass out a few good seeds and send a little fire from heaven to clear our little field and maybe even plant a little garden for you so that you can recover. He's a gracious, gracious God. Romans 8 and 27. He who stretches, searches the heart, knows the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, his intercession is not only interceding for those things that we've done, but interceding for us that the will of God will take place in our lives. Did you realize he's up there interceding that the will of God will take place in our life? See, he didn't violate our will. That's where his government needs to be extended into, is a to our will. If we can get his government extended into us, then the will of God can be made known to us, and we can learn how to walk with him. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Now, I know, everybody in here loves God. But just because you love God, it didn't prevent you from doing some things that put your name in the wrong book, did it? Didn't love him enough to stop getting the last word in, stop getting the last jab in, stop telling lies, stop hiding. We didn't love him enough to do that. So he's interceding for us again according to the will of God, so that the will of God can begin to take place in our lives. And we know that God causes all things that work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are two things, to those who love God and those who are called according to his purposes. So if last year there was a lot of things that you did that you were called to do for yourself, you missed a lot of the things that God called you to do that would fulfill his purpose. You realize there's two parts to that. And what is his? God causes all things to work for good. Those who love God, number one, and those who are called according to his purposes. Did you fail in that this last year? Anybody going to raise their hand? Ah, love on us, people. That, look, there's my... I want to be called according to his purpose. I love him, but i got to get the other part straightened out. His purposes. What is his purpose? I want to let you think about that because that's not the topic of our subject right now, but he has purposes for you. He intricately designed you, formed you, and he's wanting to fashion you. You're like this rough diamond that will not reflect his glory unless you let him cut upon you Cut around the flaws so that there's no flaws left in it. 
You know, you can start with a diamond this big, but if it's got a zillion flaws in it, you might end up with one the size of your finger. To finally get one that's true, you've got to cut away all the flaws. And if we allow him to do that, and the brilliance of his presence can come, he wants to, so that he can reflect himself out of us. Stunning light. I meet individuals, a stunning light pours out of them wherever they go. Why? Because the presence of the Lord is there and it's reflected out of them because they've allowed him to cut the facets necessary to reflect him and his glory, not them and theirs. So, the trumpets are still blowing. These blessings are going to be poured out. You could see the blessings being poured out and what God had for those who loved him and those who did these things. He would run to get in line. Say, I want that. I want that. Well, you, you, you've got a whole year to work that out. You've got a whole year to work that out. You've got a whole year to work, win his favor, and you can start today. You can win his favor today. The thing is, is keep in the position to maintain his favor. Now, does this have to do with your eternal salvation? I'd say it's got a little bit to do with it, but he's mighty gracious. What it has to do with his is you learning to walk with him so you can have encounters with him here. Not phony encounters. Not barking dog encounters. Not howling at the moon encounters. Not all kinds of weird stuff that they call the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is real. Language of angels is real. Gifts of the Spirit are real. But they glorify God, not man. They bring him in our presence, and it's his voice that's supposed to be in our presence. Let's go on. With those he foreknew, he also predestinated. See, if you've got the three books out. Ah, oh, you spent five minutes with me. Oh, it was so delightful. Oh, I foreknew you for five minutes. Yeah, I know. You spent the rest of the year over here in these two. But uh, the five minutes. Oh, Father, the five minutes. That was glorious. He foreknew you for five minutes. For some, it was 15. For some, it was an hour. For some, it was an hour a week. For some, it was an hour a day. Whatever measure that you have taken time to allow him to foreknow you, he says he also predestinated to be conformed. See, it, it, that conforming happens as I spend time with him. And I can only spend time with him on his terms. I can't spend time with him. I can't snap my finger. Okay, hey, hey, break time. Got five minutes. Come on. I'm getting my coffee. Come on, get your word out. Come down here and talk. Not going to happen. Any of you gals going to be influenced if your husband says, ah, five minutes, get ready. We're going in the order and we're going to that really turn you on? Don't turn God on either. We got to be at his beckoning call. We got to be prepared. We got to be ready for that. We got to be ready for that. He wants intimacy with us, but we have to be ready for that. Dressed and arrayed and ready. And if he opens the door, I don't care if it's five minutes, I'm coming through. I'm ready. I heals it all. And that's a hard one for me to get over. <laughs> I see I'm his bride too. And know this, he, he, he predestined me to be, that he's going to finish the job of help conforming me to his son so that he was the first month, firstborn among many brethren and these whom he predestinated, me, got five minutes in the book, he also called. So if you spent five minutes with him, he's going to be calling you everywhere. I mean, how many of you have a cell phone? Huh? How would you like one from God? Would you be willing to throw the one you got away in exchange for one from him? That mean you can talk to all those other people that get your attention and you can't do without, and people have to go to bed and sit across from you at the dinner table, and you think, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here. I, I thought you wanted to see me. You, 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 you want to be with them. Oh, well, okay. I told you a little story, I think, one time that Went to Disney World with my mother-in-law, and it was her uh, 
It was her retirement party. She was a doctor of a college for years and professor and all that stuff. And so she paid for a vacation for all the family to go to Disney World. Not only that, but she bought dinner at Wolfgang Puck's. Get your checkbook out, about 200 bucks a head. It's not a cheap place. And that is, if you're on the kitty menu, it can get expensive. And Jackie and I were sitting there and watched everybody in the family on their cell phones. No one looking at anybody. No one having conversations with anybody. And it's her retirement party. Her family, she paid for a vacation, probably spent 20000 bucks to take people there, and people don't even have time to look up and have a conversation with each other. We're supposed to be the bride of Christ, and we're supposed to be sitting at his table. And if you got your perfect cell phone with you, it's a no-no if you want intimacy with him. It's his party, and he's willing to pay for it. He's willing to pour his joy into us and all of his blessings upon us. But if you've got your cell phone with you and you're more interested in things in this life, it's going to grab your mind. And you're going to be, your mind's going to be in that rather than the relationship that's right before you that you could have. But he wants to help you into something different. He wants to help you be conformed to his son. How I many you know Jesus wasn't distracted easily? Jesus wasn't distracted at all. Even when the women, even when Satan came into the desert for 40 days, he wasn't distracted. He just kept right on talking to the Father. He didn't have many conversations. He said, and these whom he predestinated, he also called. And these whom he called, he justified. Praise God. If I can just get the five minutes, I can get some calling. And while I'm getting the calling, well, I got some bad things over here. He's justifying me. You need a little of that? That's what's going on in his government and has gone on for the last 10 days. I wondered, okay, am I supposed to speak more on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and all that stuff? And go, yeah, Lord, just put the whole enchilada out there. And show them in Scripture. Show them in Scripture where they can participate in. Now, I need some justification. And those whom he justified. Now, how did I get justified? I got five minutes with him in the book. I know, I got a lot of improvement to do. You know how many hours are in a year? I don't either. Got a lot of improvement to do. But just over my five minutes, he's going to start calling and calling and calling and calling. Incessantly. He will wear you out, I hope. He wears me out sometimes. He has to to get my attention. Such a bonehead. He keeps calling. Well, the phone's ringing. Is somebody going to answer that? <laughs> the only one that can. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't unless you hang up the others. you got to hang up the others. And he's willing to call you and call you. And if you answer, he's willing to justify you. If he calls you, there's something he wants to talk about. He says, well, Curtis, uh, you know, I'd like, like it if you didn't do this. Yes, my Lord. Instantly. Intercession, justification takes place because I'm in agreement with him. Even if I say, Lord, yes, but would you help me do it? I, I've wanted to for a long time, but I, I've not been able to accomplish it. My doer's broken. And some of us give up on a doer and don't even think we're supposed to have a doer. We just think we're supposed to have a thinker. But your thinkers aren't right. Your thinkers can't accomplish it. Thinker can't take over the will to get to the doing. So the doing's broken, but there's really nothing wrong with the doing. He's the one that's going to help us do the doing also he said i'll help you with that but it's going to take five minutes right and hopefully that gets raised to 10 and 15 and then daily and then several times a day several times a week until it becomes it becomes our life why because once we get a taste of it a taste of his presence we won't want anything else you need, you need an exchange of your treasure because what your treasure is is where you spend your time. What your treasure is is where you spend your money. What your treasure is, you guard and you keep it private. That's where your treasure is at. So how do we change that to where our treasure is him? Because if we can get in this position, he's not only going to justify us, but he's going to glorify us. Anybody know what glorified means? 
Jesus said, don't touch me. I've not yet been glorified. <laughs> Walking around in a dead body, kind of like me and you. Except I need some nails in my hands and feet. Kind of pin me down with some of my stuff that's inside. I hadn't been glorified. It means he hadn't been in the Father's presence physically. Glorification means you get a visitation of Jesus in person. You need a little glorifying? You realize what happens when a little glorifying takes place? You've heard me sure a thousand stories, and they're endless, and they just keep coming, and more memories come back of things he's done. He's done so much, I can't keep track of it. And I hope it continues that way. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if last year you didn't have much in this book, whatever you got in this book, hang on to and know that Jesus loves you and loves you and loves you. And so much so that he wrote that down and it didn't matter if this book outweighed that book, he put you in the book of the in-between so he wouldn't have to make a decision about any condemnation. Yes, you missed some of the blessings, but they've not gone away. That's why he says he has storehouses in heaven. A storehouse, he stores up what you should have received. He stores up what you could have received had you been a receiver. Most of us want to receive what we want. This is what I want. That's what I want to receive. And we dictate to others what we want. But God says, will you receive something from me? Sorry, busy with my stuff down here. Jesus wants to separate us out for himself. And he wants us to know because we had that encounter with him. We did some things in his presence. We're in that book of the good. They said, now, I know, you got a lot of stuff that's damaging over here in this book, but I want you to know there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing that can keep you from me. You realize you're entering a year, if you belong to Jesus, you're entering a year that nothing can keep him from you except yourself and your own pursuit. He'll not allow the demons to keep you from him. He'll not allow even the circumstances of life to keep you from him. He's calling to you and saying, come and be with me. Come and receive my love. He goes on to say, will not separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He, Jesus, has to be Lord. He has to be your Messiah. You have to understand that arrangement that he has with you be your Messiah? I'm hoping that you're getting out of this an understanding of the arrangement that happens every year and the continuing process of his intercession daily for us before the throne. Daily, daily. But especially when the books are open. I love it that the books are only open for 10 days. I don't want the angels to see that volume the rest of the year. <laughs> and I don't want Jesus to have to look at it. I'm sure he's got some short angel with a pencil. Keep track. I know. Got to write everything down. Someday Jesus is going to cast that book of mine that's not so hot into a place that is hot, burn it up, to separate me from those things. Between now and then, he has a good plan to help carry me into his presence, to help call me into his presence, to help me into fellowship with him. Hebrews 2, 16 and 17 in closing is, for assuredly he does not give help to angels. Did you realize that? He didn't give help to angels. <laughs> They're there to help him. They're there to do his bidding. But he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Who's the descendants of Abraham? Huh? Abraham's covenant was based on faith. Whoever has faith in Jesus Christ is engrafted into that covenant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to make like 
Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become merciful and faithful. Did you realize that's why he came to the earth? So he could be tempted. So he could face everything that we face so that inside him would be not only faithfulness, but he would understand why we need mercy. Things that we go through. Somebody that's gone through the same things that we've gone through. Watching family die. Watching disease. The average life expectancy of a person back then was about 35. You realize that. Someone 40 was considered old. And someone that lived to 70 was considered ancient and somehow enchanted by the gods that they weren't already dead. Now that puts a lot of us there, doesn't it? <laughs> Where we're closely embarking. Therefore he had to make, be made like his brethren in all things. How many things? Next time you think, well, I, I, I don't know if anybody's ever gone through this. Jesus has. He understands that he might become merciful and faithful and a high priest in things pertaining to God, not just the delivering of the blood, all things pertaining to our Father and our relational functionality with him, and all things, to make perpetuation for the sins of the people. And that wasn't going in and just touching the horns on the altar with the blood and putting that on there. Yeah, he officiated that part, but that's not the full meaning of what perpetuation is. Perpetuation is that by which God is rendered perpetuous. You know, but you don't know the definition of that, do you? By which it becomes constant in his character. And government to pardon and bless the sinner. Government was established. I, I need pardon. And something is I need, as much as I need a pardon, I need to be blessed. And this world is still cursed to bring forth briars and thorns. And unless we can get his blessing, it is nothing but a struggle every day of our life when we get up, knowing that everything that there is upon planet Earth is against us, and every demonic force has our number, knows our address, knows the people, knows the business, knows where we work. Every demonic force has some sort of demise for us unless he comes up and he says, I bless you. Bless the ground that you walk on. I'm going to bless your children. I'm blessing your home. I'm blessing where you come to worship me. I'm blessing the things I've put in your charge. Blessing your husband. I, I, I dare you to think about Speaking wrongly to your husband if God's put a blessing upon him. You just stifle that blessing. I blessed your wife. And what if you upset the arpel card on that and throw a brick at your wife? God looks down and says, well, I guess you didn't want the blessing that I gave to her to enter into your house and then enter into your life. It affects our prayers greatly. He came to pardon and bless. That's what his functional governing thing is that he does every new year that he starts. He came to pardon and bless. He didn't come to condemn. He came to pardon and bless. So I hope you have thought through the part about all the places that you need a pardon and thought through the process of what can be acquiesced for this upcoming year in blessings. Note this, the perpetuation does not procure his love or make him loving. You do that with your earnest affection and the time you spent with him. And then his perpetuation has far more meaning to himself even if you don't respond, he's still going to try to get you in a position that he can pardon you and bless you. Even if you decide not to love him and surrender your life, he's still trying to try to get you in a position to pardon you and bless you. Oh my goodness, do you realize what happens if we lay our life down? Do you realize what happens if we fall head over heels in love with him? You know what it's like to have the favor of someone? 
how his favor is the most precious thing that you can have on this earth. You can have your way. You can have your say. But what I choose is to have him. Can't have both. I want him in his garden. I want him in his garden with his government. I need him and his pardon, and I need him and his blessings. I need his love, and I need to give him love with all my heart, mind, soul, and body. In Romans 3.25 and Hebrews 9 and 5, that same word that's used for propitiation is the same word that's used for the mercy seat. It's the same word that's used and translated apothereth in the Greek. It means covering. In Exodus, it was the covering that was over the mercy seat. I need his covering. I need to get in a position to have his covering. That position is a loving position. He's willing to give me perpetuation regardless if I give him my life and love him. But how much more, how many more blessings can be acquired? Do you realize the blessings that were poured out on Abraham was because Abraham believed the Lord. He loved the Lord. He laid his life down. And here I am, Lord. I will follow you. Here I am. The Lord said, wow, the man who wants to be with me, the man who wants to commune with me more than what he has, a man who's willing to walk away from his palace and follow me. And how many times did God bless Abraham? He blessed him with a wonderful wife. He blessed him in a land of promise for all his seed from now on. How many of you need a little promise for some of your seed that really looks bad? <laughs> you know, some of your seed needs to be burnt, doesn't it? God said in Abraham's seed that it would be forever. I need that, especially as I'm getting older. I need that understanding that there's going to be carrying on, especially that which is in the Lord. I need his covering. He blessed Abraham when he went to Egypt with great riches. Great riches. Brought him back into the land of promise. And then blessed Abraham again in a great war where the angels went and fought with him. 300 guys against an army of about 20,000 and he slaughtered them all and it says that Abraham didn't have to do much. <laughs> and Melchizedek, what do you say about a man that's blessed with a direct encounter with the servant of the Most High that stands in God's presence alone? And what do you say about a man that says, here, take a tenth of all of it. And that man takes that and supernaturally takes it into the throne room of God and gives it to God. What do you say about the blessing of God showing up and the Son showing up and the Holy Spirit showing up and them sharing the things that are going on in the heavens and the things that Satan is doing and the things of the land? What do you think about a relationship that is so blessed that God himself would come and walk with you? It all comes from that little heart. It goes thump, thump over here. I want that fellowship with you. I need that. I cannot live without that. His covering, his life, his heart, his mind, all of it culminating into one thing so that we can come into the realization, I want to protect you. Will you let me be your protector this upcoming year? Will you let me become your God this upcoming year? For there, there's some things I'm not your God in. Did you know that? There's some things your God in. I'm covering it. I'm covering the book so no one can see it. Would you please give it up? I think that's some pretty serious interceding for us.
And no wonder the trumpets blow and blow and blow for 24 hours nonstop, night and day, at the declarations of God and the proclamations and all the things that he's doing, the angels cheering in heaven, the government of God established once again that the blessings would flow down over the earth and flow onto mankind and in mankind and in our lives and in our hearts. The blessings of his presence, the blessings of his fellowship, the blessings that get us out of the thorn bush, blessings of knowing him. living with him to the point that we learn to live and move and have our being in him. With that, I think we would like to do the worship and then we're going to partake of his covenant. But we are now into the point of receiving this blessing. Shouldn't we enter into a covenant with him? Shouldn't we? Let's, let's worship him for a few minutes and then we're going to enter into covenant with him.